Yeah. And then, and then, of course, the the the, um, the search for her started. This intensive search, and I suppose when we have to cover the the, the fact that you, as a family, were hanging on to the moment that maybe she would pick up the phone or you would get some clue from that phone and there was uh, the first massive betrayal yes when we did first hear about that it was just before the trial as usual we were just being thrown in the deep end and there was no time to kind of prepare ourselves I did find it really hard and I was worried about what messages they'd heard and whether it was mine and the fact I'd said Millie you need to come home dad's really really cross and I was just like, oh my gosh, if they read, if they heard that, then maybe they're going to take my dad away. I literally thought it was going to happen on a daily. Which is exactly what a sister would say to another sister yes. if, she, if she was late or looked like, well, where are you? What are you doing? Come home, because you know, because yes. it's really cross. I think people were ringing as well to kind of to so they could hope still. And yeah. I think most of well, I think everyone at Heathside knew. I think my family knew that she wasn't going to be like coming back, I think, really early. And the fact it gave your mum false hope because it appeared that those messages had been read and opened. Yes, it was, um, the emotional roller coaster we were always on was so ridiculous. You'd be fine one moment and then the police would ring and then it would be like, gosh, what's going on now? And so I think when she heard that, she was just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, she's alive. And then it turned out that that wasn't the case and they had been deleted and so it was really really hard then and there was quite a few kind of instances where things like that kind of built up some hope and then yeah people were ringing in saying they knew where Millie was and things like that it was just a kind of constant and you must have felt at that moment completely and utterly helpless and that moment and I don't know whether it's that what gave you the strength but you went to, to Downing Street and you met uh, the Prime Minister at the time, David Cameron, and there was this moment that you had with him where he was trying to explain something to you, he was trying to explain the situation, and you had this steely core inside you, and yes. you, and even some of his aides spoke to you after and said your speech was fantastic. And, yes. And, and what was it that you said to him? I told him to man up, because my dad's uh, kind of... My dad and in the trial and my mum just took such a battering it was horrendous to watch and they literally lost nearly, well, they lost, mum wanted to end her life after it, basically. And so when I was in David, with David Cameron, I was like, look, this is the level that we are operating on. We're operating on like a minute by minute that mum can just make it through this afternoon. And I was like, I've got nothing to lose. I've lost Millie. My mum now says that she wants to end her life. And what life does that leave for me? And when it happens to a child, they do feel like they're going to lose both of them and you can't rationalise it. You become completely, like, catastrophic thinking and the worst is always kind of really, really ridiculous, but you can't stop it. So what did you say to him? I said to him that he needed to man up and that there was lessons to be learnt from the phone hacking and that he should be the government that made these changes because people would respect him a lot more. What and did he, he, did, he did listen, he listened, and he said, I'm really, really grateful that you came to see me, and if you need to see me about anything else, please please feel free to come. Well, your, your treatment at the hands of the press at the time was shocking. There's a, there's a picture in here. A uh, press photographer captured Dad devastated after the humiliation at the hands of Belfield's barrister. To get this photograph, the press arranged for a lorry to block our escape route. And so there he is in the car. You are so you're pinned down. Awful. You can't go anywhere because you're blocked in so they can get the shots. Yes. I mean, luckily, I wasn't in the actual courtroom where my dad was being questioned, but I saw um, him before, and there's a photo just when he was about to give evidence, and he's just got this music on, and it's this song by The Who, Behind Blue Eyes, and he was like, that is what just got me through. Mm -hmm. And then he was... In some way, it was a freeing experience for my dad to give evidence because he just said, like, now you've got nothing on me, everyone knows, and there's no, like, you can't keep kind of... Uh, yeah, it's, it, he felt free and he stood up for me and my mum and dad and he was... I saw more of my dad in that moment than I have in a very long time. Really? You, you really? stood up for the family yourself. You stood up in front of, uh, of Rupert Murdoch. And yes. You uh, allegedly made him cry. 
Yes, that was, yeah, that was completely... Uh, I can't hardly remember it, but I can remember him crying because it was... He was, he was so, li like, frail and delicate and I actually felt sorry for him because I was like, gosh, this is so much stress for you. Like, at your age, you should just be putting your feet up in, in like, an island somewhere. And he did, yeah, I said, what would you feel like if your mum's phone was hacked on her last, in her last kind of couple of minutes. And then he just looked down and said, like, started crying. And it was, it was a completely surreal experience. Did, it, did he ever apologise to you? Yes. He did? Yes, And what he did. did he say? He said, I'm really sorry that we did this, or like, that my organisation kind of did this. Um, and I will hopefully learn from this situation and but I did say to him that if he had hacked Belfield's phone, it would be a very different situation. Yeah. <laughs>